always want to pick on the syllable of the north. So this morning, I'd like to spend a little time with you on the uh, Battle of Sullivan's Island. Uh, it's popular in South Carolina to think about the, uh, the time of 1780 to 1782 in South Carolina, the Civil War, um, as opposed to when the revolution was actually starting. So I'd, I'd like to um, share with you some uh, things that perhaps you thought were historical facts that are not, building on what David Ruhr did last night. The technology revolution is enabling a history revolution. There's so much more available now than was available to researchers a few years ago. The internet and communications technology, so just something as simple as a Google search, uncovers information today that we couldn't get to just two or three years ago. That I'm irritated every time something like naval documents goes online and searchable when I was going laboriously page to page through it just two years ago. Uh, the downloadable maps make a world of difference. So I want to share some things about this battle that may be new to you as they were to me. And, you know, as a matter of introduction, you may wonder how Marion got my attention. Um, <laughs> well, I grew up in Venezuela, in Marlboro County, and uh, first became interested in Marion in 1965 in the eighth grade, uh, the town of Marion, that is. Uh, I have a sweetheart there. College friends up north were amused that my girlfriend was called the Swamp Fox. Um, I'm still seeing her, and I'll, I'll see her later this evening. We've been married 39 years. When your in-laws are in Marion, you get to know Francis, at, at least the legend. Uh, this is the statue in the town square of our hero. And it shows a chronology of his military career. And you see the part I want to talk about this morning, the Battle of Sullivan's Island, where he was a major. Um, I'd like to share a bit about the battle, the key players, and Marion's little known involvement in the battle. There's all kinds of legend about him in this battle as well as him everywhere. Um, there's an account of uh, Marion going to unbar the gate to the fort to let General Lee come in. Oops, Gabriel Marion, a lieutenant, not our hero. Um, but to set the context, since uh, we may not have all had breakfast uh, or been up uh, long enough and had enough coffee, this is the battle where the heroes that are well known were Colonel William Moultrie and Sergeant Jasper. Marion was in the action with Moultrie and Jasper, and some say that he recruited Jasper. I don't know. Uh, the unsung hero of the battle was uh, Colonel William Thompson, um, whose property Dick Watkins told us all about yesterday from right in this area. Like so many of the uh, Patriot leaders, Marion, Moultrie, Thompson must have known each other really well. They had um, they had worked together, they lived in the same area, they were uh, all in the Indian Wars together in 59, 60, 61. Um, they had uh, served in the local uh, assemblies and legislators, they all were part of the state um, colonial and later patriot legislation. Um, Thompson was elected to the, the legislature for 15 terms over a course of 30 years. And he was the guy who was pushing uh, for the uh, location of, one of the guys, pushing for the location of the state capitol at Fort Mott, his home, uh, as Dick explained yesterday. Moultrie, of course, went on to become a major general and governor of South Carolina, had an illustrious history, and did a good thing. 26 years after this battle, Moultrie published his memoirs, which became the history. Thompson, Marion didn't write very much. We have anecdotal accounts, archival accounts, archaeological accounts, but we don't have the history in their words uh, as much as we do from Moultrie. So that, that became the source document, his memoirs, for much of this early revolutionary history. Let me begin with some reminders and uh, some disclaimers. Um, early in the revolution, most of the uh, American leaders did not really want independence as being a separate, separate country. They wanted respect, 
and that was all across the 13 colonies. South Carolina, of course, was the, uh, the, the richest, the wealthiest colony of all the colonies in British North America, and the leaders of the colony were the wealthiest men in the colony. Now, business with England was good, ties were close, a lot of interlocking work, um, and opinions just weren't as polarized as they became later on for all the reasons that we discussed, the wax halls and the pillaging and so forth. Yet, tensions were growing up to Lexington and Concord for years, and mainly we think of it as after the Stamp Act, and all 13 colonies overthrew their colonial governments in 1775. Now, just for context, look at some of the things that were going on uh, in the North. Uh, just in that year between April 19, 1775, and the Battle of Sullivan's Island, which picked up at about the same time a year later. Um, incidentally, the climax of our battle came on June 28th, which was the very day that Thomas Jefferson and his Committee of Five delivered the first draft of the Declaration of Independence to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. <coughs> the Declaration, by the way, was approved six days later, July 4th, and as David mentioned last night, signed by a couple of people, most signed it in August. And interestingly, you know, one of the myths is that this battle uh, influenced the Congress to approve the Declaration of Independence. They didn't find out about the victory of Sullivan's Island until the 19th of July. So it took about three weeks for the, the word to move. Maybe it influenced somebody to sign his name, but I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. Things were equally busy here in South Carolina. Think of all the things that were going on in that year leading up to this battle. Um, the the uh, Provincial Congress morphs to become the General Assembly. They formed three regiments. Christopher Gadsden has first regiment. William Moultrie has second regiment. William Thompson has third regiment, which is the Backcountry Rangers. The Drayton, Tenet, uh, Hart, Kershaw, Richardson mission uh, to show force throughout the state and uh, engender support one way or another for the, uh, the, the revolutionary cause uh, occurs uh, over a period of two or three months. William Thompson, James Mason, and his men are involved in this as well. Uh, they, there's a Cherokee ambush at, at Kiwi where Thompson's horse is shot out from under him. His good friend, Mr. Salvador, becomes the first Jewish man to lose his life in the Red Revolution. He dies in Thompson's arms. There's a wonderful letter from Thompson to Rutledge or Drayton uh, in the uh, Historical Society where he talks about his, his friend dying and how he captured two of the Indian, um, uh, captured two Indian prisoners and told them, you will take me to your village. If you cannot find your village, you will die. If we get to your village and no one is there, you will die. Take me to your village. They took him to their village. And he says, the Indians from that village will no longer annoy us. So he could be a little bit of a tough guy. But then, at the same time, um, these other things are going on. The ships are skirmish skirmishing, the Cherokee and Tamer in Charleston Harbor. The royal governor is about to leave. He finally leaves. Um, in the summertime, Campbell, the uh, Moultrie's task to seize Fort Johnson. Marion actually is involved in the seizure of Fort Johnson. Um, uh, we have the first uh, overt act of war, perhaps, in the state, depending on who's first you like to claim. But perhaps Fort Charlotte would be the first overt act of war. Uh, certainly Great Cane Break. Uh, where Thompson and 1,300 men capture 130 British in a snow campaign where um, Richardson was in charge of it, Thompson was the main player. Um, those are going on. Uh, Thompson in the, in the Great Cane Break was credited with saving the lives of, of dozens and dozens of uh, the loyalists who were captured. Uh, so it's the other side of Thompson. Look, we're just trying to get along here. Then there's a fugitive raid on Sullivan's Island, which is important because some of the same people involved in that raid at Sullivan's Island, which was thought to control the harbor of Charleston, some of the same people involved in that raid will show up uh, later on in the Battle of Sullivan's Island. 
And of course, we have a 34-year-old president of South Carolina. Now, most of the players here are, are in their 40s. Um, Marion Moultrie, Charles Lee, George Washington, they're all contemporaries age-wise uh, in their 40s. Thompson was called Old Danger as well as Danger, um, Danger because of his fierceness in battle and he always seemed to be where the action was. And some said that if he had you in his sights, you were in danger because he was reputedly the best shot in the backcountry. Our man, Marion, this is kind of a quiet time for him, but some called him the silent man because he was quiet in councils. He was a member of the legislature, but wouldn't state his opinion, but generally thought to be favoring independence. You know, I don't know how to read that stuff. You can't find documentation of what people did not say. <laughs> so a little bit of a tough task. Um, when the second regiment was formed, it was formed mainly from people who were in the legislature. Um, and Moultrie became the colonel. Marion became a captain in charge of recruiting a regiment, which, I mean, a, a company, which he did by going up to Black Mingo in Willtown and um, very quickly uh, recruited his company. And is credited by some with doing more than his share of the training of the regiment. Um, you know, he had worked for Moultrie back in um, 15 years earlier. And Moultrie knew the capabilities of this man, so he probably had a, more than one company's worth of, of uh, impact on the formation of the regiment. And then, of course, he's involved in the siege of Fort Johnson, where the British had left before the, the uh, Patriots came in. He then is posted to Dor Dorchester, where later on the records of Charleston were moved. Uh, Charleston has a tendency to move the records when they think the bad guys are coming. They started it here by moving the, uh, the records, the printing presses, the munitions up to Dorchester, essentially Somerville, um, and Marion was posted there to secure the armaments, the munitions, and so forth. Then we see him when the, um, uh, th there's a change in the state troops, he becomes a major and appears at uh, the fort where he's involved in the, in the construction of the fort that became Fort Moultrie. So busy times uh, for context. So here's what was going on with the British that caused us to have the Battle of Sullivan's Island. It was a debacle for the British. It was minimized in all their histories. You know, you write about your victories. Uh, Peter Parker blamed General Clinton. Uh, Clinton blamed Parker. Clinton went to great lengths to justify his failures there. His dispatches and his memoirs are just replete with, uh, I don't know, I, I can't recall the right word for bullshit. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever that is. Carl Borick has found, Borick has found nothing in the Cornwallis papers to mention this, yet Cornwallis raised his troops, brought his own regiment over here. He was involved for two months in this Battle of Southern Asylum. It, it never happened. Um, uh, Bannister Tarleton was there. He was a cornet in, uh, with Cornwallis. I can't find anything about it. So if any of you find anything about these tidbits, please let me know. We're trying to put together as much definitive information as we can about it. Of course, this was followed by the British success at Long Island, which was a great victory for the British. So easy to sweep it under the rug. And of course, the Patriots disappeared as soon as it was over. The uh, Cherokees had the uprisings in the back country, so Thompson and some of Moultrie's men went there to try to squash those uprisings. The um, uh, Moultrie and Lee went down to toward East Florida and then Lee's called back north and so it just became you know, a pinpoint event that was then lost to history. But it was, it was um, hardly a raid as it's treated in uh, much of the Northeastern written history from the 1800s. It took at least eight months to plan and execute <coughs> Uh, it committed a substantial portion of the British war machine in, in North America. And it was personally approved by His Britannic Majesty, King George. So here's what happened with that. Um, the British start over, and while they're on the way to um, gather at Cape Fear, the uh, loyalists in North Carolina are routed by the Patriots at the Battle of Morris Creek Bridge, which was in uh, February. 
So the idea was that Clinton's coming down from the Northeast with by land, um, the um, Cornwallis and Parker, and those are coming across the ocean in ships. Uh, Clinton arrives first, and he he finds that uh, Battle of Morris Creek Bridge had occurred, and there was virtually no loyalist support uh, after that. that. That's about 20 miles, by the way, from Wilmington Inland, and it's a wonderful national park site now, very well maintained. So um, Germain's orders to uh, Clinton instructed him to, when they gathered at Cape Fear, they were to pick the location for uh, an action that would uh, establish the presence in the southern colonies. Um, but they were to get back to the north for the campaign that became the New York campaign, and which was to be a summer campaign. So they get together, they find that North Carolina is out of the question. There was some talk about going up into Virginia. Um, but the obvious place to go was Charleston, because that was where the, the greatest resistance was considered, the economic power was considered, and uh, Germain's uh, instructions make it pretty clear. So they sent a major Moncrief from Cape Fear, which is at Baldhead Island, essentially. Um, major Moncrief uh, comes down in a couple of boats and um, actually goes ashore on Sutherland's Island. Uh, Moultrie's memoirs start with a great line that says, uh, in the course of reading these memoirs, you'll see how little we knew about what we were doing in the course <laughs> of the revolution. <laughs> Moncrief, a British officer, rows onto Sullivan's Island makes small talk with the guard, walks around, sketches the fortifications, gets back in his boat and rows out his road and out to his ship. And that's when the guards realize he's going the wrong direction. <laughs> and they shot at him about 50 times, but he wasn't hit. So he goes back and he says, not only is the fort incomplete and not a very defensible fort, there are a bunch of bums down there. They don't know what they're doing. And so uh, they decide, well, maybe we should go to Charleston. So that's how they chose Charleston. Now, pretty easy choice to make when you consider that it's uh, the largest city south of Philadelphia. Uh, I looked at the, uh, the economic records as, as they exist for uh, the year 1774 on the eve of the revolution. In 1774, of the 10 wealthiest estates probated in the British North America, Nine were in the South Carolina Low Country. There was vast wealth. Peter Manigo was the richest man in America. Nine out of the ten wealthiest estates probated in that year, right there in the Low Country of South Carolina. The influence of the state went beyond uh, its borders, with Georgia and North Carolina being less mature, less populous states. The idea was to, to take Sullivan's Island and then leave a couple of battalions and a few frigates to secure the harbor and then later return to take the city. So history polishes up characters like these, but they all gain valuable experience at the Battle of Sullivan's Island. And it's a great training ground for those who would be the heroes later in the revolution in 1780, 81, and 82. I'm much more interested in the real people believe beneath these uh, uniforms because they didn't dress like that in the Battle of Sullivan's Island. In fact, if you've been a British soldier during a three-month voyage wearing your woolens from Fitbrew, where we in Ireland, and you arrived at Baldhead Island, you're kind of smelly by the time you got to Isle of Palms or Long Island. In fact, the the uh, Battle of Sullivan's Island and the Palmetto Log Fort there was not the first encounter that the British had with what became our state tree. There's this wonderful diary of a gentleman named Dr. Foster, who uh, the diary stayed in the family until the 1930s and was released, of course, after all this history was written and retired of it now because all we care about is the Civil War. Well, in that diary, Foster talks about the Palmettos at Bald Head Island where they were camped. So they went ashore to rest and recover. Had a little skirmishing with people on shore. But this diary says that um, they had discovered on June 9th, I think, uh, no, no, May 9th, they discovered the cabbage plant 
single palmetto. And that if you boil the root, it tastes very much like artichoke. And so they were consuming it with much avidity. Nine days later, he writes, we are no longer consume much of the cabbage plant as it has been found to be highly disagreeable. <laughs> so Palmetto was working for us before they got down here. The American defense. So everybody knows everybody is like Republicans and Democrats. I mean, Moncrief can get away with this sham at Sullivan's Island because he looks and speaks British. Well, everybody was British in Charleston, or it seemed like it. Um, Charleston's population at the time was about 12,000. More than 5,000 British show up offshore and stayed on Long Island. About 7,000 uniformed uh, Americans show up as well. So they're equaling the whole population of the city, which is the fourth largest in America, for this battle. Not a small battle. Now, Charles Lee, you know, uh, Rutledge, did a magnificent job, well regarded by everyone, even though he was only 34 years old, because he was an attorney. And we love attorneys, always have loved attorneys. Um, <laughs> he was especially good because he was not billable. And we love attorneys when they're not billing more than ever. <laughs> um, Lee was a colorful character. Most of you know something about him, I suspect. But he was a mercenary British officer. He wanted, he converted. He wanted Washington's job. He was made third in command, uh, sent south by Congress to take over the southern, uh, to defend against the southern campaign that everybody knew was coming. He was volatile. He was rude. He was coarse. Uh, he lost two fingers in a duel. He married an England, uh, uh, Indian woman and had twins by her. Uh, Travel with a pack of dogs, uh, was abrupt, rude. He was the polar opposite of the Southern gentry. You know, Marion could play that game, Thompson could play that game, Moultrie played that game masterfully. As an example, when he arrived, he immediately goes out to Fort Johnson, where Marion had been involved in securing it for the Patriots a few months before. And there was a new battery that had been thrown up. And he says, what damn fool designed this battery? And the lieutenant with him says, sir, this was designed by Mr. Drayton, our present chief justice. To which Lee responds, well, he may be a very fine chief justice, but he's a hell of a bad engineer. <laughs> you just don't do that in 1776. British strategy. So they come down, they're offshore, they arrive at Deweese, it sends Charleston into a frenzy. Uh, people leaving town run into the militia coming in from the back country. Uh, Cornwallis' own regiment, the 33rd, was here with him. They're the only unit, I believe, that was in the Battle of Sullivan's Island, the only British unit that was in the Battle of Sullivan's Island, and then returned for the action in 1780 and later. Simple strategy, they're going to stage in by the Hole, which is offshore, uh, just outside the Charleston Harbor, on the other side of the, of the uh, on the inside of the Charleston Bar, which is the sandbars that protect, protect the harbor, of course, are always moving around. Um, the Army made a decision to stage on Long Island. This is an intriguing uh, statement that, um, General Clinton makes, as they're planning the invasion, you know, he was a staff officer, he was accustomed to covering his tail, and he, and he says, this is, he wrote this before he ever came down here, and he says, I shall not attempt any object before I first reconnoiter it. He lands 3,000 men on Long Island before he does the reconnaissance. Then, on the 18th of June, is when he says, oh, my goodness, that inlet is not portable. So, but he's beginning to cover his butt because what difference did it make? Breach Inlet, which is a quarter mile wide now, was a mile to a mile and a half wide then. It had at least one creek that was at least seven feet deep at low tide, average bridge, not, a little, not seven feet. Um, and it's, it's laced with pluck mud, 
potholes and sandbars and ripping currents. There's no way you're going to line up in British fashion and march. You know, at three miles an hour, it takes an hour to go a mile. You're not going to do that if it's defended at all. They knew it was defended because from early June, before they ever landed, um, Major Sam Wise from up in Chiraw District had 210 men at the point of, of Breach End. Uh, it was just bad strategy. So the second regiment's in the fort. That's Moultrie's job. Uh, Marion was with him. He's a major. He's uh, aiming cannons. The um, uh, first regiment's over at first jo uh, Fort Johnson, and third regiment was at Breach End with the troops from. North Carolina, Virginia, militia, and so forth. Uh, the, the group at Breach Inlet was really diverse. A uh, hodgepodge of people and uh, worked together amazingly well, even though it wasn't all smooth sailing. Um, the 780 were, th this is Moultrie's memoirs are the numbers most people use. Um, and uh, I haven't found anything to dispute the numbers that you see here. We've created an order of battle which is on the website for the best we know and we're adding people all the time when Will or Leon finds a pension application that indicates somebody might have been there. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody wants to be with a winner. Like, remember when Roger Bannister ran the sub four minute mile in 1954? He said there were about 750 people there and I've met all 10,000 of them since. <laughs> The Orangeburg Militia was probably there, and Captain Felder was probably there. We can't prove it yet, but we're going to. Um, these people had seen cannons. Some had Fort Charlotte, for example. Most of them had not fired cannons, and they didn't know anything about artillery. Thompson's a backcountry guy, good rifleman, not a cannoneer. So they worked it out. Um, the 4th Regiment was an artillery regiment. Most of them were over at the fort, but uh, in the middle of June, when the British started staging, Moultrie and Thompson, who had worked together forever, they actually drew the boundary between the Carolinas in 1772 together. They were the two military men on that mission. And they're still arguing about it. I think they were not such good surveyors. So the, the, um, they work it out how to do it. And they actually had slaves supplying the cannons, according to some British Counts. The Indians fascinate me. Of course, you know, everybody called the Indians that were friendly to the Patriots, Catawbas. Um, it looks like the Indians that were involved at Breach Inlet probably were a combination of Catawbas from present-day Rock Hill area, but also some of the coastal Indians from the PDs and Wacomas and Santees and so forth. This is how the battle shaped up. Um, the can you read that in the last row? Uh, what it basically says is that um, this is Fort, which was called the Fort on Sullivan's Island or Fort Sullivan, and then right after the battle is named Fort Moultrie. These are the nine British uh, warships that are poised to attack the fort. Um, and inside the fort, of course, Moultrie has uh, 30 cannons or so he has power for 28. Uh, over on the continent, you've got um, a little fellow by the name of Thomas Sumter. Brigadier General Darren Armstrong has uh, 1,500 men just inside at what we call Mount Pleasant now. They call it Hathaway's Point, which has morphed over time. Um, up in this area is a landing where the uh, Patriots thought the British would try to land. It's called Bolton's Landing. It's about three miles from, from here. Uh, Sullivan's is three miles long, so, you know, you can see where it would be, a little inland. This is Long Island, which is long. It's uh, twice as long as Sullivan's, a wilderness like Sullivan's. There were no buildings on either, um, either island at the time of the battle. The battle. There had been a pest house on Sullivan's, but it had been burned during that raid in December. Um, the British men of war, there are nine. Um, and so the idea is to attack here. Charleston City is over here, downtown, six miles away. So up here, the British are staging on Long Island, and they've got uh, 3,000 troops. They have floating batteries. They have artillery pieces. Uh, they have 
uh, ships that only have a, a sloop and two schooners in the creek behind Long Island, which is now called Hamlin Creek. Um, it's got 15 armed flatboats uh, that have swivel guns on the front of them, and the idea of the flatboats, of course, is to come across here. It didn't work this time, but the same flatboats apparently were used in Rhode Island and New Jersey uh, just within months of this. The same people went up there and had the great victories. And that's where Thompson is with uh, two or three cannons and his men spread out, uh, you know, in this area. So the, the fight at the fort is pretty well known. Essentially, um, the uh, the action started late morning. The uh, uh, British began bombing with a. Uh, find the thunder bomb. A bomb ship, a bomb ship from out here, too far away, fires about 60 shells, can no longer fire those 13 inch mortars. The others pull up side the fort and attack. Um, in hindsight, they probably didn't, didn't get close enough. Uh, they couldn't shoot from the tops down into the fort. Um, one of the first men who tried to do that was killed, and so Peter Parker said get out of the tops. But they probably didn't get close enough. There's a wonderful notation in Clinton's um, papers where he comes back in 1780 and um, he goes out to the fort and sounds the area where Peter Parker was. Now, now Clinton, of course, is over on Long Island, but he sounds this area to try to prove that Parker could have gotten close enough to do a better job. And it proves it. And he, in his own handwriting, he says, Quote, what say you now, Sir P. Parker? <laughs> I mean, irritating. Uh, the key thing that happened in the battle was that these ships, three of the ships, tried to go around to attack in the cove from the unfinished rear of the fort. And they run aground on a sandbar. Does anybody know what that sandbar is now? Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. Named for the boy that was over here trying to prevent the landing, um, Thomas Sumter. It, it does help to be old uh, when it's time to name a new fort, and so uh, So they, the, uh, during this battle, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what we know about what, or, or what I can find about what Marion was doing. Um, but, but first, he got involved even earlier. So he's stationed at the fort, and he's with Moultrie. The, um, the battle at Breach Inlet, however, didn't start on the 28th. It was actually won before the 28th, in my view. And this is subject to interpretation. So the British land in mid-June. Thompson's scouting on the 18th of June as the British are, they've staged back at Deweese Inlet, six or seven miles back this way. As they're coming down, Thompson sends men over, they're scouting. And on the 18th of June is the first account of a kill in the Battle of Sutherland's Island. He was dressed in red, faced with black, uh, with a cockade and a feather in his hat and a sword by his side. That's how we knew he was an officer, according to uh, Richard Hudson's letter book. Richard Hudson was involved in this battle. He was actually over at uh, Fort Johnson. He was a man about town. He was later lieutenant governor of the state and was the first intendant or mayor of South Carolina. So in his letter, he's having dinner with General Armstrong, who was technically Moultrie's boss. So he got pretty quick information. And within a couple of days, he writes about this. There's fighting there every day until the uh, 28th of June. From a key place they fought, a sort of distance, this is about um, 400 yards from here to here. And it's changed over time, but something like that. Um, well, let's say today it's 400 yards, maybe a half mile away. That sandbar, this is the channel that was seven feet deep. Uh, there's uh, a battery here, two batteries here that the British set up. So what they would do, they would hop across here, cross this creek, come down, this is marsh. Get in the marsh, they set up firing positions behind oyster banks. And the oyster bank is a wonderful natural defensive position. Um, three or four feet high, you can hunker down behind it, get up and fire, and it's impenetrable to fire. So it was a, a brilliant strategy, except for, let's call it a tactic, except for the fact that the tide rises and covers oyster banks at high tide. And then, how do you get back? Uh, a little bit of a problem. Uh, 
President Rutledge is there, then there's an account where he goes to um, visit the troops and uh, a bombshell from the British, probably fired from Green Island here, um, hits near him, he's not injured, but he takes a fragment back to town, you know, I'm George Bush. <laughs> you know, um, there was actually skirmishing on these sandbars. Um, you know, a lot of little individual accounts in the peak in the uh, the pension accounts and little mentions here and there. Uh, there there's an account I love. Uh, I, I, they set up back here, uh, and the, the creek here was was fairly deep here, but not really navigable by by, by boats of draft on Solomon's Island down here. There are accounts of the, of the men throwing down their arms or placing their arms on the ground and hailing each other across the creeks and asking about people they both knew. Uh, they even spoke in Gaelic. It indicates to me that probably some of those uh, loyalists from uh, the Battle of Morris Creek Bridge came down with either Clinton uh, coming down by land or with um, Parker and the ships after that Battle of Morris Creek Bridge. You can't prove it. But Sam Wise writes about this. Sam Wise is from Girard District, which is not far from Cross Creek, which is Fayetteville. And, you know, they knew each other and were asking by name about people that they both knew. The, um, David mentioned last night the camp followers, the women and children, that there, there was a standard for something like 10% of a regiment uh, could be uh, added on as um, friends and relatives. There, there was an account where um, Thompson is writing to Moultrie, um, to Rutledge, after the battle, and he mentions he's using President Rutledge's spyglass, and he's mentioning that the uh, British are leaving now. It's um, early August, I believe. And he says, I'm watching the women and children moving to the east. So they were, he was here, and he's looking at them back here, and they're moving east to go get on the ships to head to New York. Um, it's interesting, he was writing that in response to Peter Timothy, another man about town who happened to publish the newspaper, a member of the uh, assembly. Peter Timothy had put in the paper that all the British had left. And Thompson writes back, or writes to Moultrie, he says, I am uh, sorry to see that Mr. Timothy has snuff in his eyes. <laughs> Isn't that a great term? So essentially this battle that goes on for 10 days is one of maneuver. Uh, Clinton's trying to find out how he can get across. He knows he can't afford. He's trying to figure out how to get the flatboats across. But the flatboats, you know, that, that's a mile or a mile and a half. It takes a long time to row over there. They hold about a company each. Well, you've got to come over. You've got 15, so you can have six or 700 at a time. You've got to establish a beachhead and go back and get more. Your artillery support has to come from here at Oyster Bank or here on Green Island. Uh, it's really too far from back here. You can't figure all that out. As part of the maneuver, um, Charles Lee makes a suggestion to Thompson uh, during the course of the, this 10 days of fighting. He's here, and he says, huh, uh, I know, you know, he had served with Clinton. He says, I know what he has over there. He can take you out whenever he wants to because he's got the cannons to do it, probably 32 pounds. He says, Thompson, you might want to move back a little bit. And what Thompson does is overnight, now the British take a month from the time they arrive. It's supposed to be a coup de main, you know, a sudden attack. They take a month to have a spot of tea and figure out what they're going to do and, and move down from one end of the island to the other. Overnight, Thompson moves his entire force back 500 yards and has entrenchments going from one side of the island where it's marshy over to the other side of the island on the ocean. Clinton wakes up the next morning, and you can see in his dispatches his power meter is just going down. He's disheartened because he realizes now he's moved back. We have no way to get to him with artillery. In fact, when he's back here, Thompson has an 18-pounder and one or two six-pounders. He can fire on them when they're in the inlet, but they can't fire on him from back here or their light artillery here. Checkmate. He got it. And Charles Lee, we like to pick on, you know, he later was a traitor. He wrote a plan for the British to, after he's, you know, disobeys Washington and you know, writes a plan for the 
British to attack uh, the Americans, so we discount him. He was crucial to this battle. Thompson couldn't have come up with that by himself. So, at, so that's, that's all going on in that 10 days. Um, I want to tell you about Marion in this period. What are we doing at the time, George? Marion did during this um, this short time, Thursday, June 20th, 1776, middle of the 10 days of fighting. Um, a party of Thompson's Rangers paddles over to Long Island at night. Now they're seeking a reward offered by President Rutledge for the first prisoner that can be taken. Um, you know, the civilians really need to let the military do their thing because what happens according to a letter book. There happened an affair with a very tragic, comical nature. When they began landing on Long Island, our president offered a premium of 30 guineas, that's a couple of thousand dollars in today's money, to any rifleman who should first take one of the King's troops prisoner. Accordingly, three of them went over at night for that purpose. Two of them agreed to keep together. The other determined to go by himself. The morning by twilight, the one that was alone described the other two at a distance, and imagining that they were the king's troops, took up his gun to fire at them, thinking, I suppose, to kill one and then take the other alive. One of the others, seeing his piece presented, was quicker than he was and shot him through the thigh, upon which he fell. They immediately ran up, dragged him to the boat, threw him in, and pushed off, all thinking that he was one of the king's troops. They had got a considerable distance from the shore before the poor man was sufficiently recovered from his fright to speak. As soon as they, he spoke, they discovered their mistake. He is likely to recover. <laughs> Interesting thing the internet does for us. So this this account and a pension record, you know, are on the Thompson Park website. A man, Daryl Goss, in Florida, contacted me and was trying to find his uh, relative, who, according to the pension records, was shot in the hip in this battle, and was was on um, Thompson's team. I have not met Darrell Goss, we're female friends. He gave a little bit of money to help establish the park. Um, so I said, well, you know, I wonder if this could have been your, your relative. And he said, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> My man was shot in the hip and he carried the ball the rest of his life. Now, 235 years later, by a hip, I don't know. Two weeks ago, I got a letter from Darrell Goss. I've been thinking about it. You know what, maybe that was <laughs> Anyway, all right, so, so here's how it relates to Marion. After this particular little action, the next morning a British patrol traps that Patriot Party to their boats, and it starts a, um, a, a big skirmish that lasts for hours. There's artillery going back and forth. The, um, the Patriots are hulling the ships that are in the channel. Um, there, there are these opposite accounts of what happens. Uh, the Dr. Foster goes to a high point. He sees Highlanders and British infantry maneuvering by platoons and firing volleys. And he says they kill about 20 Patriots. Then the Patriots say, yeah, we had a little fight and uh, we had a guy uh, whose hand was blown off and failed to sponge a cannon. And, you know, who knows what really happened. But it's loud, it's a lot of action. At the same time, um, the British start their attack that was, this was one of the days picked for the attack. The weather turned unfavorable. They started the attack from the sea, turned around and went back. Here's how Marion relates. Um, this is from Francis Marion's orderly book. And this is the 22nd of, of June. So we've had this attack. You've had all this fighting going on back and forth. The breach generally is quiet at the fourth. Then the British start. Meanwhile, the Patriots have realized the main attack must be coming from Long Island. Marion's orderly book says, uh, part of the regiment, i.e. 200 men under Major Marion, marched to advance guard, that's what Thompson's group was called, at five o'clock afternoon. General Armstrong, this is Moultrie's boss, ordered them to return. They arrived at the fort at eight o'clock at night. So Marion was actually a breach in it. I never knew that until Carol and George told me to get my stuff together. And uh, 
I never would have seen it, never would have known. So I appreciate the opportunity to find that Francis Marion was also involved in the Battle of Bridgeman. So what happened after all this going on? On the 28th of June, finally the British make their major assault. Uh, the assault from land is repelled. It was maybe a diversion, maybe not, you don't really know. In my heart, I think Clinton did enough to keep Thompson engaged there, thinking that the fort would be knocked down. The British strategy was to have um, troops come ashore with the Navy uh, from that end as well. And this is well documented in all their, their accounts. They thought the fort would fall down, they just march in. Clinton realized he was stymied, so he did enough to uh, do his job, be covered, but he quit quickly. Um, and of course his orders from Germain said to not have man manifest sacrifice. So there are these five different attacks, uh, Clinton's neutralized, the uh, assault from the sea is this wonderful heroic account that I don't even think we've over glorified over time. If you read the British accounts of it, they are just as dramatic as the American accounts. The, the British, the Americans lose um, 10 or 12 men and an uh, equal number of wounded. The British lose 100 and something. And if the Americans had not run out of powder, they would have sunk those ships and, and it, everybody on both sides knew it. Um, one way they got the power, powder was this dependable guy, Francis Marion. In the middle of the afternoon, about three o'clock, both Thompson at Breach Inlet and Moultrie at the fort, both ran out of power. At the end of the day, the, the fighting at Breach went on until about 10 o'clock at night. At the end of the day, Thompson had, according to um, Drake, Thompson had one charge for the 18-pounder and three charges for a six-pounder. He was done, and, and he hadn't been firing for a long time. Moultrie did the same thing where he paced his firing was real careful with it. He ran out of powder about three o'clock and the rumor came at three o'clock that the British had to cross at Breach Inlet and were on the way. So he told his guys, stop firing, save your powder for your muskets. About that time, um, 500 powder, pounds of powder comes from President Rutledge. He'd been begging during the day. And that wasn't going to be enough. So Moultrie sent Major Marion out to the creek where the defense, the schooner that had been involved with the Cherokee and Tamer back in November, it was there to, in Stop Gap Creek, the cove now between Sullivan's and the mainland. He sent him to the defense to get some powder. We don't know how much resistance uh, the captain of the defense put up, but Marion got the powder. And uh, from the Marion that we know, if he went to get the powder, he was gonna get the powder. And that was, it was an important thing because that allowed them to then resume the firing and uh, we had a decisive American victory. It, it was just clear cut, it was the most complete American victory to this point in the war. And, you know, all the first, everybody claims first. To me, it's not the first time the American Army and Navy beat, uh, or Americans beat the British Army and Navy because you had New Providence before this, uh, the, after Ticonderoga and uh, Bunker Hill, the British had evacuated Boston. They lost. Um, so I, I wouldn't claim a first defeat, but it's really important. This is what Marion did. And after the battle, he's documented uh, as being in charge of the fort while the British are still just two miles away offshore. And they didn't know if they were going to re retack or not, but um, Moultrie got on with moving down to East Florida. Everything went wrong for the British. I got with an old uh, retired army general and we went through the principles of war and applied them to this battle. And they literally violated every one of the current modern principles of war. Um, at the end of the day, the biggest thing, it was just bad strategy. Choosing Charlestown, the notion that you could take Solomon's Island and leave a couple of battalions and, and some frigates and go away and come back later to take it after fighting in New York, that was folly. Where were you going to get food? I mean, it just, it wasn't a good idea. Um, and to land on Lama Island and take a month to come across the Solomons across a mile wide inlet, bad idea if you had any defense. Uh, just altogether, they shouldn't have done it. In fact, King George said the, um, the Battle of Solomons Island has not been um,
crowned with much success. I should um, be as pleased, as well pleased, if it had not been attempted. <laughs> Eight months later. It was about strategy, in my view. Um, and, you know, they didn't even use that term very much back then, but that's, that's what really happened. The Americans had good strategy. British had bad strategy. And good strategy comes from knowing that you're going to die in the morning. <laughs> Everything went right for the Americans. And I think the fact that these people knew each other and worked together for years was a big part of it. Uh, oh. if, if it had been Clinton and Parker instead of Thompson and Moultrie, those cannons wouldn't have gone up the breach inlet and the British would have come across. Uh, every little detail worked out well. And amazingly, Charles Lee, who didn't fit at all with this group, they found a way to work with him. As John Adams said, uh, his genius is worth 10,000 men. And, you know, a pain in the neck, but worth a lot. Uh, people everywhere rejoice about the battle. Uh, this is the commendation from the Continental Congress. The word arrived there on the 19th of June. On the 20th in the morning, they passed this and sent the word out. Um, and the result was the British stayed away for two and a half years. Um, and then we get into what we've mainly been talking about here. Uh, I mean, a lot of money was made from 77 to 78, and then inflation kind of kicks in. But it was, it was happy time with the wagon trails being worn out, supplying the, the battles in the north. Uh, the war shifts to the south, as we mentioned last night. This was the first British invasion. The second was, was Prevo. Um, and, uh, you know, that's when the plunder started and when the attitudes began to turn in that uh, awful uh, engagement, uh, which was embarrassing for both sides. And then the siege of Charlestown, the third invasion, which, as Carl said yesterday, the greatest loss of material and manpower for the Patriots in the entire American Revolution. Um, and then we go to what we all know so much more about, the, the battle in the back country. So to put this in context, since this battle was at Breach Inlet was mainly lost in history and um, since not much is done with the revolution in Charleston, which was kind of important back then, uh, we formed a little park, uh, a pocket park, the size of this stage at Breach Inlet at the site of the Patriot defenses. Um, we raised private money for it and um, donated it to Sullivan's Island with the idea that they will take care of it, but they don't pull weeds, and so that's what the Swamp Fox and I do on weekends. Um, we had the dedication in which um, uh, uh, more than a year ago and this great outpouring of support from the Revolutionary War community was, was just uh, terrific. And I so appreciate um, David and Charles and others involved with the Southern Campaigns for introducing me to this community of, of people who, who care so deeply and such a collegial group for the, uh, the revolution that, um, you know, it's, it's just been a, uh, a wonderful little uh, project for me. And, you know, now I'm more interested than ever in, in the details of it. Time for one or two questions, or should we move on? All right, we're going to cut it off here because you guys listen too long. Um, <laughs> so the next thing that happened is, Chris is going to tell you how that battle that was started and ended in Charleston was won in the back country. Thanks.